one. I have with me in the studio today Dr. Stephen Phillips, author of the new book Silver Lining, which is an investigation into UFOs. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good afternoon. I have with me in the studio today Dr. Stephen Phillips, author of the new book Silver Lining, which is an investigation into UFOs. Now, Dr. Phillips, can you tell us a little about your book? Yes, certainly. Over the last 12 years, I've become increasingly interested in the subject of UFOs, and this book is a compilation of all the sightings I've heard about together with evidence. You see, so many people are convinced that there is life on other planets that I thought I would do some research myself. And what did you find? Are we alone in the universe? <laughs> you sound sceptical. Well, you'll have to buy the book to find out my personal conclusion, but I can tell you this. There are a lot of sightings in a number of different countries, and the surprising fact that I have found is that despite never having met each other, a great number of these witnesses describe an almost identical object. Now, I realize that television and the media has given us all a mental picture of a UFO, a silver ship with bright lights that moves at very high speed. What interested me was that in all the eyewitness accounts I heard, people gave very precise and detailed descriptions that varied only slightly. Reports from America, Europe, even Asia, all share a significant number of similarities. Hmm, interesting. Tell me, have you been able to see any evidence yourself? Well, no. My aim in writing this book was not really to present my own opinion, but to gather all the information available and collate it into a kind of reference guide. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Personally, I don't have anything much to add apart from the conclusions that I've drawn from the accounts I've heard. I understand that there is a strong body of opinion that claims there is hard evidence that is being suppressed by the American government. Could you comment on that? Hmm. The second chapter of my book actually talks about a place in America that has often been in the media, Area 51. Area 51? Yes, it's a military base in New Mexico. In 1947, a man called McBrazel claimed... Sorry, who? McBrazel. That's M-A-C, capital B, R-A-Z-E-L. Anyway, McBrazel claimed to have found pieces of an alien spacecraft on his farm in Roswell. Now, many people believe that this was true and that the government of the time took the debris. Since that time... They have denied all knowledge of any such find, and accounts by the many leading experts at the time dismissed the claim, believing that McBrazel had actually found pieces of a higher altitude weather balloon that had disintegrated. Now, the lack of information combined with a large number of conspiracy theorists means that no useful scientific conclusion can be drawn, but I have found out one or two surprising details. Again, you'll have to buy the book if you want to find out more. Okay. Now, I understand that an overwhelming majority of UFO sightings occurred in America. Do you find that in any way relevant? Well, as I mentioned before, there are a large number of conspiracy theorists, and the popularity of science fiction programs in America could lead you to suspect that these sightings may be nothing more than an overactive imagination. However, I have found that there are a number of other factors that determine UFO sightings. In Northern Europe, the number of reports is very low, whereas in Southern Europe, where there is more open space, less light pollution, and generally clearer skies, the number of sightings increases. 
Now, when you consider the vast open areas of America, particularly around New Mexico, there is an argument that UFOs are simply easier to see in certain geographical and climatic situations. Hmm. Well, I've never thought of that. If I could ask you one final question, Dr. Phillips, what about alien abduction? Ah, uh, well, I don't really cover that in my book. You see, I was looking to present facts from which people could draw their own conclusions. With these reported abductions, I've found them to be very unreliable. Well, thank you very much for your time. Before we finish, I'd just like to add that Silver Lining is available at all leading bookstores, priced at £19.99. Until next week, goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a guide giving instructions to a group of international students in Canada preparing for a whale watching trip. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello everyone. Glad to see so many happy faces on this wild and windy day. Are you all ready to go looking for whales? I'm Tony and our other guide today is Dale. We'll be using these two rubber boats you see here and our trip today will take three hours. In a few minutes, we'll be heading into part of the largest temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest. I'll show you our route on the map here. This is where we are now. We'll be leaving the sheltered bay and heading out across the mouth of the bay toward the open water. As you know, last night there were strong winds in the area, so we can't go out into the ocean as we had planned. Near the mouth, the water will be quite rough. That's where we are most likely to spot orcas, or killer, whales, as they are also called. After crossing the mouth of the bay, we'll enter the calmer, shallower waters. This is where you look for gray whales. Then we will continue up this narrow inlet close to the shore. You will have a great view of giant fir and cedar trees that have never been logged. Here is the place to watch for wildlife. You are likely to see bears along the shore and eagles in the sky overhead. Right at the back of the inlet here are the hot springs where we will be stopping for an hour. You can have a soothing soak in bubbling hot water before the return trip. I'll tell you a little bit about the whales now because with the noise of the wind and the engine you won't be able to hear much out there. As we head out in the boat we will probably see dolphins first. They are a gray color and quite small, one to two meters long. They will swim right beside the boat, racing along and sometimes jumping out of the water just ahead of us. They swim very fast and they are playful and curious. They're really fun to watch. The next ones we'll see are orcas or killer whales which are actually members of the dolphin family. They are seven to eight meters long, very fast, and they have sharp teeth. Some stay in these waters all year round. We identify them by the distinctive black and white color. They feed mainly on salmon in these waters, but the orca diet can include seabirds, 
seals, dolphins, and other mammals. They can be fierce hunters, and this is why they are called killer whales. We should start watching for them as soon as we get out toward open water. We're likely to spot the orcas from a considerable distance. Watch for the black and white marking and mist spouting from the blowholes on top of their heads. Just outside the inlet is where we will probably see gray whales. The grays are migratory. They pass through here twice a year moving from far in the north where they feed to the warm southern waters where they breed. You are very lucky today because several have been reported in the area. Unlike the orcas, greys are solitary, except when you see a mother with a calf. The grey whales are much longer and heavier than the orcas, 14 meters long and weighing up to 30 tons. The grey whales are filter feeders, gathering tiny ghost shrimp from the sand at the bottom. We recognize greys from their tail fins because each one is different. Once we find the whales, we'll come up as close as we can safely. We are allowed to approach the whales no closer than 50 meters, but that feels pretty close when you are in the presence of animals this big. You'll see mist coming out of the blowholes when they breathe out, and you'll hear a loud hiss. If we are downwind, we might even be able to smell them, a strong, fishy smell. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, as the talk continues, Answer questions 17 to 20. Now, for just a few words of caution. It will be quite bouncy out there, especially in the front of the boat. If you want a smoother ride, stay in the middle of the boat, close to the engine. Hold on to the ropes and keep an eye on any big waves. Be alert so you don't get thrown out of the boat. In case of an emergency, you are all wearing survival suits. They'll keep you warm and dry in or out of the water. They are bright orange for visibility. The water temperature is around 8 degrees. Without these suits, you would only last a few minutes in this cold water. With these suits, your survival time is increased dramatically. They will keep you upright in the water even if you can't swim. But we don't expect anybody to end up in the water, so don't worry. Now, are there any questions? I'm afraid of getting seasick. Right. I was just coming to that. If you think you might get seasick, take one of these patches and put it on your arm at the wrist. Like this. It works on pressure points of the body and will relieve seasickness without the drowsiness you can get from pills. Are there any other questions? All right, then. Let's start loading up the boats. We leave in five minutes. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a radio program about buying a house. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon, listeners. Today, I'd like to welcome Edward Fox, who is going to talk to us today about buying a house. Edward. Thank you, Eunice. For most people, at least, buying a house is a major life event and probably the single most expensive item you are ever likely to buy. It is also a place that you can make your home. Therefore, thinking carefully before you make a purchase is of the utmost importance. One of the most important things to consider before buying any property is the location. Because remember, it is where you plan to spend a large part of your life, or indeed the rest of your life in some circumstances. Therefore, consider the type of life you enjoy leading. Are you a very sociable person, who enjoys nightclubs and discos? If so, then you may wish to consider something close to the city, or indeed, in a city where it is convenient for all types of nightlife. On the other hand, if, like me, you prefer a quieter life, then you may want to consider something away from the city. However, do remember that proximity to your place of work is also important. Indeed, we spend most of our life at work, and you don't want to have to spend two or more hours every day travelling to work now, do you? Therefore, transport is the utmost importance. City suburbs, however, are often conveniently located for commuting to work. All for shopping. Without being in the heart of a busy city. You may, however, think that a house in the suburbs would be far too expensive. Yet, houses located in cities can often exceed the price of suburban houses. So check out the prices. You may be surprised. Family is another important consideration. You may prefer a house that is away from a busy street or main road. And, of course, remember that children have to attend school. Is there a good school in the area? Or would your children have to travel a long distance to get to school? Therefore, if you have children, or you plan to have children, location is a very important factor. And, of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. There are, of course, various types of houses. There are detached houses which stand alone and are not joined by to another building. Then there are semi-detached houses, which incidentally are the most common, and for good reason, because they are less expensive than detached houses, this is because they are, in fact, two houses joined together, and therefore take up less space. And finally, there are townhouses, which are many houses joined together to form a long row. But don't think that townhouses are less expensive than semi-detached houses. They rarely are. This is because they are usually built in cities where the prices of property is very expensive indeed. The age of property is another consideration. If you're considering buying an old house, beware. You may be faced with expensive repairs and renovation bills. So have the house thoroughly checked by a professional surveyor before you decide to buy. But then again, there are things you can look for yourself. Things such as the condition of the woodwork, especially doors and windows that can be expensive to replace. More importantly, make sure all the fixtures and fittings Things such as cupboards, sinks, taps, bathtubs are all in good working order because replacing kitchens and bathrooms can be a very costly business. And don't forget the garden. If the property has one, if you enjoy gardening, then fine. But if you don't enjoy gardening, then you may prefer a small garden as opposed to a big one. But even if you do enjoy gardening, it is important to remember that gardens take up a lot of your time. So keeping a garden in good order 
may be a very difficult if you work long hours. One final thing is the general feel of the place. Does it have a good atmosphere? And most importantly of all, would you feel comfortable living there? Thank you, Edward. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. But I'll be back next Wednesday when my guest speaker will be talking about buying a computer. So until then, bye for now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. I'd like to go over some simple security measures today. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. I'd like to go over some simple security measures today. As you all know, there have been a few small incidents with students' possessions being lost or stolen and as the student representative for Middlesex Hall of Residence, I'd like to remind everyone of a few simple things we can do to make our accommodation safer for everyone and to remind everyone of the security measures already in place. First of all, I'd like to go over what security measures are already in or around the halls of residence. As you turn off the road into Middlesex Hall, there is a security barrier for people arriving by car. Students, or anyone else for that matter, have to report to security through the speaker before they can even enter the car park. Once they're in the car park, we have CCTV, that's closed circuit television, linked directly to the security office, so that anyone coming into the front entrance via the car park can be seen by the person on duty. We also have cameras around the Hall of Residence. The film from the CCTV is kept by security in case there is a problem and we need to send the film to the police to help identify the person. So, barriers and CCTV. In addition to these, there is security lighting in the car park and around the Hall of Residence, which is on from night to morning. These security measures are there to help, but the really important thing is the front entrance. At the front entrance is a keypad lock. Now, as you all know, to open this, you need your student card and the four-digit security code. As you also know, you should not give this code to anyone you do not know, and you should never let anyone into the Hall of Residence. Remember that for all the security measures we take, if you let someone into the Hall, then anything we do to keep students' possessions safe will not help. After the front door, we have the reception desk. Now, this is manned 24 hours a day, but the security guard has a lot to do and may not be there all the time. If you need to call security, go to the nearest phone or call on your mobile. The number is 966 and they will be with you as soon as they can. The next thing I want to mention are your own personal security measures. By this I mean the locks on your room door and window, your personal alarm and the university bus. All student rooms have a swipe lock that we open with our student cards. Do not leave your room door unlocked if you're going out for a long period of time and do not leave your card in a place where someone can pick it up and enter your room. 
This is, of course, common sense, but people still leave their rooms unlocked and still leave their cards around. The next thing is your room window. Everyone has a key for their window and everyone should try to keep their windows locked when they are out of the building. However, the security guard has told me that he often finds windows open and even worse, he finds windows open on the ground floor. Please don't do this. It's an invitation to a burglar to enter the hall and take people's things. Finally, two more items. Personal alarms and the university bus. Now, the Students' Union gives every student their own personal alarm if you go to collect it. A personal alarm is something that gives out a loud noise if you press it when you think you may be in danger. It lets people know where you are and that you need help. The second thing you can do is use the university bus. It takes students from the campus to the town and to other places on campus. It goes every half an hour and it's free, so please try to use it, especially after dark. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.